This is the J. Scott Outdoors podcast on Western big game hunting and fishing brought to you by GoHunt.com Insider. Research faster, hunt more. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider and join today. I'm your host, J. Scott, and I live and breathe hunting and fishing, spending half the year in the field experiencing God's creation. I hope you'll enjoy hearing about our adventures. Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have a cool episode with Brendan Burns from Kuyu. And Brendan has two back-to-back doll sheep hunts that he's uh, headed out. I believe he leaves today. And um, I wanted to go over all of his gear and all of his preparation uh, for his doll sheep hunts. And I think... Uh, not only doll sheep hunters, stone sheep hunters, mountain goat hunters, even backcountry mule deer hunters, um, any, any type of backpacking uh, hunt are going to enjoy this uh, episode. Brendan goes through his whole gear list and tells uh, a lot of his um, practical knowledge of uh, backpacking and some of the do's and don'ts that he's uh, you know, come across over these uh, last bunch of years. And um, uh, it's going to be a great episode. Before we get into that, uh, there's a couple announcements that I wanted to make uh, to, to make you guys aware of. One of them is um, you, you've probably all heard of Dropbox, and um, I use Dropbox, but another um, data transferring uh, website that I have found um, is called wetransfer.com. And it's completely free. I want to say that you can transfer up to two gigs uh, for free um, at a time. And so when I'm sending photos or videos um, off my computer to DAR or, you know, to a hunter or something else, I use wetransfer.com. They are not a sponsor of the podcast. It's just a tool that I thought I would pass on to you guys um, you can send videos, you can send photos, so it's it's pretty slick. Um, so I wanted to make you guys aware of that. I uh, also wanted to give you a brief um, uh, pitch from our sponsors. And as you know, um, GoHunt.com forward slash insider uh, is a big part of this podcast. They are the title sponsor. And when you join Insider, Uh, You you find and plan your hunts more effectively than ever. Complete state coverage, interactive maps, strategy articles, and species breakdowns. Not to mention all of the monthly giveaways. You know, they've given away or they're going to give away uh, approximately $100,000 in hunts. Um, They just past prizes included. They just gave away a doll sheep hunt for $22,500. Three Red Rock Precision Rifles, um, Zeiss Conquest HD Binoculars. Uh, they, they, as you know, we're in the week uh, four of the hunt um, in the cash unit. Uh, I believe that's uh, mid-September. It's a rifle hunt. That's the fourth week of July here. Uh, that's the last hunt of July that they're giving away. They've already given away an antelope. Uh, a mule deer and, an, and another elk hunt. And um, so being part of the Go Hunt Insider, each member, each insider uh, has a chance to win. So it's, you know, you don't have to do anything other than sign up and be an insider. Um, now, you can win a $50 Kuyu gift card by using the J. Scott promo when you sign up. So what you do is you go to gohunt.com forward slash insider click on the blue join now button and use the promo code J Scott and they will send you an electronic $50 Kuyu gift card. Um, I just uh, really appreciate all that uh, Lorenzo Sartini and his team have done to be a sponsor here and uh, they've treated me uh, like royalty and I really appreciate uh, all that they're doing. Uh, One thing else that I would mention is if you go to GoHunt.com, there are some incredible um, articles. You've got tips for bow hunting the gray ghost. You've got hunt Mexico and have a trip of a lifetime. Uh, Largest deadheads of all time. 
the creepiest photos caught on trail camera. That's a pretty pretty cool thing. And then there's a, uh, on the right hand side of the column on the website, uh, they've got all their landowner tags. And um, there's a Nevada Unit 51 all season steer tag. Uh, a, a LaSalle Mountains, any weapon uh, uh, elk tag, uh, a cash uh, north um, antelope tag, a, a Utah Wasatch archery elk tag, and, and there's hundreds of landowner tags. So you might go on there and check it out. Uh, I, I wanted to um, bring up a certain article that I thought was very, very informative, and that was one done by Brady Miller. It's called Unlocking the Power of Google Earth Scouting. And he goes through um, all the ins and outs of using Google Earth. And I have used uh, Google Earth for some time. And um, it's, it's a great article that, uh, that you got to check out here. Um, guys, also DeadeyeOutfitters.com. Uh, Deadeye Outfitters makes quality t-shirts, sweatshirts, and hats designed with hunters in mind. Um, use the J. Scott promo code and receive a 10% discount on all purchases at DeadeyeOutfitters.com. And guys, they make some cool stuff, so go check them out. I want to thank you guys, the listeners, uh, for all the support. Uh, the podcast numbers are, I mean, growing exponentially daily, and, and, and it would not be uh, possible without you guys. Uh, I want to thank you guys for all of the positive comments uh, and good ratings on iTunes. That helps me out a lot. Appreciate that. And uh, you can email me at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. And I get two to ten emails a day from listeners and questions and comments. And uh, you guys, I, I really appreciate it. So keep them coming. Um, some of the questions and comments are actually going to be turned into episodes. So um, I just want to thank you guys for that. And thank you for uh, following on Instagram, G at J. Scott Outdoors and my associate at Dar Colburn. On our Facebook page, J. Scott Outdoors, YouTube channel, J. Scott, and uh, our website, uh, www.jscottoutdoors.com. Uh, let's get right into the episode with Brendan Burns, and uh, you guys are going to love it. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have a friend of the podcast, Brendan Burns. And uh, Brendan Burns is with Kuyu and is an avid hunter across the West. And uh, today we're going to be specifically talking about preparation for doll sheep hunts. Uh, and Brendan actually has two doll sheep hunts that he's going on this year. Uh, he's going on one hunt in the Northwest Territories and one hunt in Alaska on the Chugach, and um, Brendan is uh, known around all over the world actually for being uh, one of the best uh, sheep hunters and sheep guides, and um, Brendan and his partner have uh, guided some of the highest scoring bighorn sheep in the world. Uh, they've guided two of the top five uh, largest rams ever taken in Montana, including the largest auction ram in U.S. history. Uh, Brendan has hunted uh, desert, stones, doll, and bighorns uh, across Mexico, from Mexico to Alaska, and um, I'm excited to have him on. He's been on the podcast before, and he's always a good interview and a, a great wealth of knowledge. Brendan, how you doing? Doing well. Those, those intros are uh, well, it's hard to, hard act to follow. And <laughs> <laughs> is your face red? <laughs> I, I definitely want to make it clear that that's a team effort. I uh, I, I got a couple guys I hunt with, Willie Hedinger and Al McKinney here in Montana. None of that stuff happens on your own. Um, you know, we watch those those great big rams. We watch them for a couple of years, and uh, you know, there, there's uh, you definitely don't don't kill rams of that caliber on your own. So I want to make that definitely clear. But uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, awesome. I'm looking forward to picking your brain um, specifically today to try and help any of the listeners that may be going on hunts of their own and trying to prepare in their gear and uh, what gear to take and some of the food that that uh, that you think is necessary and and you know hydration all of the different aspects of preparing for a hunt like this um, Brendan why don't you first off tell me um, a little bit about some of the sheep hunts that you've done and maybe how many sheep you've killed 
I, I've personally killed three sheep. I've got a, I got a, a big horn from New Mexico. I've got a doll sheep from Alaska, and I have a stone sheep from the Yukon. <clears throat> and I've been on. I haven't. I I haven't added. I I'd have to add it up, but uh, about fifty ram kills, and I, most of those are big horns. Um, a few, few dolls and stones, and um, four four deserts, and uh, but mostly big horns is, is I would say where I've spent most of my time hunting. Um, I've hunted in, in, in British Columbia, and, you know, it's, I, I, today we're talking about thin horns, so, you know, stone sheep and doll sheep, fan and sheep, whatever you want to call them. So, um, I've hunted British Columbia, uh, the Yukon and Alaska. Um, and then this year I'm, I'm, I'm going to hunt, um, both Alaska and the Northwest territories, which I'm really excited about. I, I have not hunted NWT yet. So, and no, knowing you like I do, sorry, Brennan, I'm getting a little feedback here. Um, Knowing you like I do, uh, you really prefer the rugged, adventurous backpack style hunts. And that's one of the things that I, I kind of want to talk to you today about in um, how you handle the, the elements and how you handle getting prepared for that. I know preparation on a lot of this is, is key and, and can make or break your hunt. Um, w- when did you start and maybe what are some of the mistakes that you made um, early on, maybe on some of your hunts or what are some of the revelations that you found that are completely necessary when preparing for a hunt like this? Yeah, I, I started sheep hunting actually when I was about 14 um, in the unlimited area in Montana. And I never, I never killed a ram in the unlimited area when I was younger. My dad used to drop me off and um, I kind of had, had, uh, you know, I just go in for four or five days by myself and, uh, before I could even drive. And, um, I, ne- I never was successful in killing one. And I, I, it basically was just wandering around in the mountains, hoping a, a bighorn sheep would attack me. And, uh, <laughs> that, that was how I started, but I've always just, I, you know, I always used to see, I, I I've growing up, you know, you, you'd, you'd meet guys that you just knew were better hunters than everybody else. And, and, and it seemed like, Every now and again, one of those guys had taken a big horn and, 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 or had been up north sheep hunting. And it was just like these crazy adventures. And it was, they always, you know, killed big elk and mule deer and all that stuff. But it really, they were just like, oh man, that was the best hunt I've ever been on. And so, um, my dad, I've, I had some friends, Drew. I, the first sheep kill I was on, I think was around 2000. Um, and then, uh, I've had some friends draw my dad, Drew, and, and I really, you know, have dived into it since then. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those things you don't have enough tags. I mean, I've, I've been unusually lucky how much sheep hunting I've been able to do personally. Um, but it's just one of those hunts where it's just fun to go. Um, yeah. So I, um, yeah, pretty, that's, that's basically where I got started. And then as far as mistakes go, we don't have enough time. I mean, I didn't even have binoculars the first time I hunted sheep. I mean, uh, not knowing where they're, I mean, I, I've made so many mistakes. It's, uh, it, we, we couldn't even go through it. And so you basically started out and just tried to wander into them. And from the sounds of it and having hunted Cooster with you, I know you know the importance of optics. Um, tell me about uh, what the role of optics play in your sheep hunting now. Well, I guess when I started sheep hunting, it was more, you know, covering country. And, you know, the unlimited area of Montana is kind of a unique thing. You can just buy a tag over the counter. The success rate is slim to none. But you got a sheep tag in your pocket, and I didn't know any better. And I actually, believe it or not, passed a legal ram up um, on an unlimited hunt when I was uh, about 15, and I just didn't know what I was looking at at the time. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, the, the optics thing is, you know, basically I was wandering around in the woods trying to hike them down, and rather than sitting down and, and trying to figure out where they were, you know, I mean, I, I in, in elk hunting I call guys that do that Christmas tree hunters because they just go to the mountains and wander around in the trees, you know, and and it's, it's, you know, not knowing what you're looking for, where you're looking, what do they feed on? What well, I had no idea. So, um, you know, it's just been a long process of, you know, figuring out what, you know, different sheep do different things. And, um, you know, just, just, uh, it's been fun. It's trial and error. And, and, and a lot of times you're not really looking for your own tag. So that, that makes it a lot of fun is that, you know, there's not the same exact pressure involved in it. It's not, you know, you just don't get to hunt them enough. So you have two hunts um, coming up here here in about a week, I think you leave or so. And so, can you tell me about each of those hunts and uh, uh, how you came about those hunts? And then we're going to dive into your preparation specifically for those two doll sheep hunts. 
Yeah, I've got uh, uh, a hunt that uh, Jason and uh, Jason Harrison and I are doing in the Northwest Territories with Nahanni Butte Outfitters. Um, we uh, when I started working at Kuyu, one of the things that uh, Jason uh, said is, you know, we're going to go on a hunt every single year, and you know, you kind of you, you're not going to forget you, you got to be out there doing it, you know? So every year we do a big hunt. Uh, it's just part of the, part of the fabric of, you know, the company. It's just one of the things we do. We go on a big hunt every year. Last year we did a BC stone sheep hunt. And this year him and I are both doing doll at, in, in Northwest territories. <clears throat> and then, uh, I'm doing back to back. I, uh, I've been applying in the Chugach, um, for probably 10, 12 years. And I, I drew a Chugach Alaska archery tag. It's a limited draw tag and, and doll sheep and, um, uh, and, and so I am doing back to back 20, I mean, on the top end, I'll be gone 24 days. Um, so we'll do Northwest territories. I fly directly from there to Alaska and then, uh, and then go hunt doll sheep in the, in the Chugach. So, uh, two hunts back to back, which would be just super fortunate to be able to, you know, obviously had a, had a hunt book that was, that was going to be a, you know, kind of your trip, trip of the year kind of hunt and then to draw another tag. And, uh, yeah, it's a pretty, uh, not common, but uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. That's incredible. And by then you'll have uh, by the end you'll have five five sheep, uh, two more doll added to the list, um, and then you all you're going to need here eventually is a desert to complete your grand slam. And and actually, if you could get two deserts, you'll be pretty dang close to getting your double slam. Yeah, well, I, I've never really thought about it that way, but uh, yeah, I. I uh, um, yeah, I'll have, I, I've had more sheep hunting opportunities than just about anybody I know at my age. And just, you know, I, I won a stone sheep hunt. I've, um, you know, just been in the right place at the right time. And I've just been persistent at trying to jump on any opportunity that came up. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I look at, uh, the desert thing will be fun. You know, at some point in time I'll draw, I mean, every drawing everywhere. Um, I, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes at, at the end of the day. I'd, I'd be just fine having 10 dolls in my trophy room by, you know, by the time I'm 60, um, you know, I, I, I really love hunting, you know, sheep up North and the big, you know, the big open areas up there that are, um, you know, that, that's, that's what my favorite sheep hunts are. So, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll see. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to draw a couple of dolls, uh, win a raffle, something like that. So I'm, or a couple of deserts, I mean, but, uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes, you know. Walk me through uh, having never hunted in Alaska, never hunted in uh, BC or the Northwest Territories. Uh, something that is definitely on my list that I want to do. Can you kind of walk me through a typical day of, say, the the doll sheep hunt that you're going to go on and the chugach that you drew? Uh, maybe from start to finish, m- maybe from getting to where you're going and and the actual process. Um, and then walking in, hiking in, you know, horseback, backpack. Tell me, tell me how that's going to go down. Well, uh, the, the two doll sheep hunts I have are, are basically polar opposites. No, so the Hanny Butte Northwest Territories is a helicopter hunt, um, which, which is really cool. You basically get dropped off in prime sheep habitat. If you get moved, you get moved, um, you know, with a helicopter. It's, it's, a, it's a great way to hunt. You know, the, the Northwest Territories is so big, so remote. Um, I think 90 per, 95% of the sheep are killed through outfitters in the Northwest Territories. There's almost no resident harvest. So, um, it's a helicopter hunt. It's not quite as physical, I would say, as, as a lot of hunts, but, uh, it's a super efficient and, and a really fun way to hunt, hunt sheep. Um, um, just to be clear, Brendan, do you get dropped off down in the valley floor by the, by the creeks or rivers, or do you get dropped up, up with good elevation? Um, I think they like to drop you down low just, just, just so you can move around. I, I think they'll put you wherever. It depends on where the sheep are. It depends on what drainage you're hunting, what mountain ranges. I mean, you'd have to take a look at a map in the Northwest Territories and look at the size of these areas. Like the area we're hunting is like 1.6 million acres. So, I mean, they're, they're, it's massive. You know, they, they have these, you know, whole mountain ranges they won't hunt for years. And then they'll go and take you, drop you in there. So they, they put you in as good a spot as you can, and you go from there. It's, it's basically a backpack hunt once you get dropped off. Um, so yeah, and there's, you know, you can't, you can't hunt, I believe it's 12 hours, there, it hardly gets dark, so I want to say it's 12 hours of the next day, it's a pretty good length of time before you can even start hunting, so it's, you know, obviously ethically everything is, you know, on the up and up, um, and then the hunt that I have in the Chugach, um, the Chugach State Park is, uh, is close to Anchorage, so everything, it's a draw tag, it's always, it's been on a draw tag forever, so, 
it's walk-in only. There's no airplane assist or anything. So you start walking wherever you end up driving to. So you could fly and get dropped off outside the park and hike in. But the, the Chugach hunt is about as physical from – I've hunted it once before. Um, I've hunted goats in the Chugach. It, it's probably – I mean, there's some debate to it, but it's probably one of the toughest sheep hunts in the in, in the in the United States, or in the in the in North America for sure. I mean, when when you talk to guys that have hunted and taken rams in the Chugach, there's it, usually a story of man, that was a tough hunt. I mean, it's it's really brushy, it's super steep. Um, it's just it, you know, so these these two sheep hunts are basically total opposite uh, of each other. One is you know. The NWT doesn't have the brush. It's got big, wide open vistas, you know, perfect sheep habitat, actually, in the Northwest Territories to the Chugach, which is just a just a mess. It's just a steep, nasty, ugly, uh, brushy area to hunt sheep in. And that's why it grows some of the biggest sheep in the world. Before we get into um, the actual gear and such, I want to ask you about physical preparation and how you prepare and how you see other people that go on hunts prepare and maybe some of the things that have helped you and maybe some of the mistakes that you've seen uh, that other people have not done in the physical preparation for those hunts. Yeah, I mean, I, I always tell guys that the, the, the number one thing in physical preparation for a sheep hunt is to be mentally tough. You know, it doesn't have anything to do with physical um, you know, you, you're going to go on these hunts, you're going to get tired, you're going to get worn down. You know, if you put everything into it, you, you, you can't train enough to be just, you know, like I'm just running everywhere the whole time. I mean, like, you just got to know, like, it's going to be a grind. Um, the longest backpack hunt I've ever done, uh, my stone sheep hunt, it was about 17 days. And it's like, there's nothing you can do to prepare for that. You just got to be mentally tough. You know, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to hit the wall at some point in time. You just got to know, yeah, I'll feel better and just push through it. And um, as far as training, as far as physical training goes, you know, life gets in the way. I, 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 my first sheep hunt I ever went on in 2008, I basically took six months. And it, it's it's really all I did was just get prepped for this thing. I, mean, I was working out two times a day. And, you know, now I'm, I'm older. I've got a family, work and all that stuff. It, you know, kind of life gets in the way. So I try and do as much as I can. And I, uh, you know, like I just got back from a two-mile run. Uh, about an hour ago, like broke off at lunch and took a, did a two mile run. Um, I try and do one huge day, um, in the mountains at least a week with weight on my back, um, which is, you know, better than anything you can do physically. Uh, you know, last Friday night I walked in, did about 18 miles, um, in the Bob Marshall, um, and came out Sunday morning, you know, in a 24 hour period. And, and, uh, I think those days probably do, do more for your, uh, your physical prep on a hunt like what we're going to do than, than, than anything. So I, I try and, I try and not get out of shape. I, I, I really, uh, try not to just let the winter weight get on. I, I try and work out year round. And, and if you don't get out of shape, you're just, it's a lot easier to stay in shape. You know, it's interesting. I talked to Jason, uh, a few weeks ago and he mentioned the same thing that he tries to stay in shape and, and how much of a difference that makes for him when he just is constantly um, staying active. So I think that's important for the listeners to hear. Um, Brendan, let's dive into gear a little bit. And uh, I'm, I'm sure from the first sheep hunt you've been on, you, you've done it and seen it all. Um, can you walk me through your gear list uh, from head to toe as far as uh, what you're wearing, your pack, your shoes, uh, everything? Yeah, um, let me pull it up here. I got, I got, it. I actually just wrote it all down um, so we can go through this. Um, so, as far as um, it depends on what hunt you're doing, and 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 I obviously my job at Kuyu, most of the t a lot of what I do is advising guys what to take on sheep hunts. So there's a, there's a, some things you got to ask yourself before you go on a hunt. You know, for example, I ask guys, you know, where are you going? Are you going to British Columbia? Are you going in the Northwest Territories? Are you going in the Yukon? Is it a horseback hunt? Are you going in Alaska? Are you getting flown in? Um, are you going, you know, sheep hunting, basically thin horn hunting starts July 10th in the, in the Northwest Territories, or I think it's the 10th in the Northwest Territories, and, you know, hunts up until the latest thin horn hunt in North America is the late archery hunt in the Chugach, which goes until October 10th. So, um, just saying, hey, I'm going on a sheep hunt, doll sheep hunt. You know, what, what does that mean? I mean, you're, you're running the range of 
summertime in the Northwest Territories in the early season versus, you know, the, the late archery hunt I did in the Chugach was, it might as well have been December in Montana. So it, it, you, you got to kind of know what you're doing uh, to, to put the good, a, a great system together for you. You know, if you're doing a horseback backpack modified hunt, whether it's a true backpack hunt and you're carrying everything on yourself, um, is it a, is it a backpack hunt where you're getting airplane assist, you know, where you're not carrying all your food, you're getting food drops. Um, so the, the most important thing, like there is no magic bullet. You got to kind of um, look at it from, you know, what's the hunt you're doing? What's the temperatures you're expecting? Um, how much country are you covering? I mean, there's areas where you can hunt stone sheep in British Columbia where, it, you know, you, you can't walk for 10 days. I mean, you walk right out of the right out of their concession. Um, and there's area like the area I hunt in the Yukon. You could walk for two months. You're not going to walk out of there. So it depends on what you're doing. Um, so you got to, you know, like I said, there's no magic bullet. You just got to look at each hunt and go, okay, here's here's what you can kind of expect. And here's the game plan for going through it. And then as far as gear goes, <clears throat> if it's a, I'll just go through what I'm taking on. These hunts are basically both backpack hunts. And one is earlier season. I, I would say the Chugach hunt's going to get some nastier weather than it is in Northwest Territories. But um I'm I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go a little bit lighter in the Northwest Territories, and I've been watching the forecast. It's looked pretty good. We're gonna get some rain, but <clears throat> and then in the Chugach, I I pack for. I've had some 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 weather in the Chugach in in early August or in mid August that is absolutely some of the worst I've ever been in. So I I I, I will hedge my bet that way a little bit in the Chugach. I'll, I'll take some some heavier duty stuff, but uh, both these hunts I'll be carrying. You know. Our 7200 Icon Pro, a big backpack, um, you know, you, you almost can't have enough room. Um, I try not to fill it up. Um, I go through every sheep hunt I do. I write everything down. And anything I haven't used on on two hunts in a row, I leave out of my pack. So I've got my, my system pretty dialed as far as how much stuff I'm going to take with me. But, um, depend, you know, another thing is, is it a rifle hunt? Is it a bow hunt? You know, what, what, what are you going to take? But I, it, I'll just quickly go through um, – what I'm going to take on this hunt. I'm going to take a 7200 Icon Pro. Um, I'm going to take a, 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 a Sil Nylon waterproof pack cover um, because I, I, you know, generally it's a backpack hunt with a tent. So you're leaving your pack out at night. Um, on the Northwest Territories hunt, I'm going to take a 30 degree waterproof super down bag um, with a, with a um, X-Ped NeoAir sleeping pad, you know, 30 degrees, a little light on the Chugach hunt. I'm going to take a 15 or a zero degree, depending on as we get closer um, what the temperatures are going to look like. Um, I always bring my own tent on any hunt that I go on. Um, to one, I've been on enough hunts now where, you know, sometimes you're paired up with somebody, you don't know who your guide is or who you're going to be with. And I, I can't sleep. I have my light sleeper. I, I don't like to be around snorers. So I just always bring my own tent. You never have to worry about it if you bring your own tent. Um, and then as far as clothing goes, um, you know, obviously, uh, Brendan, let me interrupt you for a second. Which tent are you taking in the Northwest Territories? I'm going to take um, our Mountain Star two person tent. That's what we basically designed it for. It's uh, and I always like to take a little bigger tent that I need. I've been using our Ultra Star this summer a lot in Montana. And it's it's it's, it's awesome. Um, but I'm going to take a two man tent because um, got I like to put my gear inside and we're getting dropped off with a helicopter. Um, it's three pounds. It's not that big of a deal. Um, so yeah, in, in the Chugach, I'm taking a prototype tent that, uh, that we're coming out with, uh, down the road here. Um, it's a four season tent. Um, a couple of years ago, I was in the Chugach on a goat hunt. We got 80 mile an hour winds. Um, and it was, it was gnarly. It was a mid August. So, um, the, 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 the extreme weather can be pretty bad in Alaska. So I'm going to, I'm going to take a four season tent. So, okay. and then, uh, so my, my skin to shell system, quickly is uh in in the northwest territories i'm expecting it to be warmer rather than cold and i'll probably regret just saying that but um i'm gonna wear tiburon pants 145 long underwear uh I, I take a super down pant with me and rain pants that's it that's my four things that i take on the bottom and i will use gaiters um i really like the tiburon for early season sheep hunting um it, especially if you can be really if, if it can be really warm my my Yukon stone sheep hunt was we averaged 70 degrees in 20 uh I believe I did that in 2013 and uh I, I wish I'd have had lighter stuff and, and you don't really prep for that when you go north but a lot of times it's it's unusually warm especially lately um and and on the on the on my top 
I, I'm going to take 125 Merino. Um, I always love a Merino base layer. Um, and then I'm going to take a 200 Peloton, uh, some of our new synthetic, and then a 250 Zip uh, Peloton. And then I take a Super Down jacket uh, with a hood and my rain gear. Um, and I've kind of pared it down over the years. I don't really take a soft shell jacket hardly anymore. I, I just have you know, kind of cut stuff out. I've had a few hunts where I didn't use it. And, uh, you know, you, you can definitely get by with that. Um, so that's kind of taken on the, on the clothing side. Brendan, you're going to take the super down jacket and not the Kenai jacket. And why? I am going to take the super down jacket, um, on the Northwest Territories hunt, uh, because it's, it's, it's warmer per weight. I don't, I don't anticipate wearing that very often on that hunt, maybe at night glassing, stuff like that. Um, but I don't anticipate wearing that with my backpack while hiking at all. So, um, it, the, it's, it's warmer per weight. On the on the Chugach hunt, I'm taking the Kenai. We we can we could see some cold weather. Uh, I may be ha- hiking with my insulation on, and and if you're going to hike with your insulation on, that that Kenai jacket, the synthetic, obviously breathes better. It weighs a little bit more. It's a little bulkier, but it's maybe a little more universal. Uh, it works a little better as a as a true outerwear piece. Okay. So, um, you know, and I, I'm going to take you know a beanie, a hat. Um, a set of gloves, um, you know, guide gloves or Tiburon gloves, um, you know, it's a leather palm glove, um, <clears throat> four, four pairs of socks. I, uh, I, I like to take an extra pair of socks or two. Um, I take, uh, I, I basically don't take anything extra on any of these hunts. I don't take extra shirts. I don't take, uh, you know, I've got, I basically have one extra shirt total, which is kind of a mid layering piece that I'll use sometimes, but I've, I've had so many hunts where I just had the same extra shirt sitting in my pack. And at the end of it, I, I didn't use it. So, uh, I just, I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe, uh, you know, sometime it'd be convenient to have that extra shirt, but if you're going to get your weight down as low as you can get it, you just have to, you know, sacrifice some stuff. And so, um, I really don't double up on much, um, you know, we're Merino regular underwear and, uh, and that's it, you know, and in 10 days I've, I've never had it to wear, uh, you know, uh, you can get by and it's not, you know, it's not something I look back on a hunt and go, geez, I wish I had two of those. So that's, that's kind of my philosophy on getting, getting rid of stuff. So Brendan, you're wearing, uh, four pairs of socks in 10 days. Do you wear, uh, the same pair two days in a row or do you constantly switch them and, and, or do you, are you constantly washing them or at least getting them wet and trying to squeeze them out? Or are you doing anything like that? I, uh, I have pretty wide feet and I have, uh, and I definitely like a thinner sock. Um, so I, I use our Merino socks outer and I use a super thin liner. So I basically will rotate and it's kind of funny. Sometimes I'll go five days with the same sock and then switch out the whole pair or some days, depending on how, um, you know, wet you get from sweat or if you get wet crossing a stream or something like that. And I'll go every other day and I try and rinse them out whenever I can, but I just kind of play it by ear. I mean, I've had hunts where, you know, it was, it was nice and dry. We didn't cover a ton of country. And, uh, I, you know, I think I just changed the liner sock and used the exact, you know, the same pair and kept one as an extra in case it did get wet. So, um, I take two liners and two regular, um, on a 10 day hunt. Okay. Okay. And do you wear, um, glasses as well? Sunglasses? I do. I take a pair of sunglasses. I find I don't spot as much game wearing sunglasses. So really I keep them in my pack unless it's super sunny and you're going to get like, you know, uh, you know, sunburn on your eyes or, uh, um, snow blindness, especially we did that hunt last year in British Columbia where we did, you know, hours and hours on a glacier and you basically had to wear sunglasses, but I find I spot more game without sunglasses. So unless it's super bright, I don't wear them that often, but I, I de- that's definitely one of the things I've got in my pack. What about footwear? Um, I'm wearing scarpas right now. I have, uh, you know, I, I, I advise a lot of guys on boots and, and we make a great boot and there's, there's a lot of good boots out there. Um, I like a stiffer boot than most guys like. And, uh, you know, the thing about boots is, uh, the boot itself is only half the equation. Um, it's what fits your foot and, you know, you can have the best boot in the world. If it doesn't fit you, it's going to rip you up. And conversely, you can have a boot that's probably not that optimal for a hunt, but it fits your foot. Well, um, it'll, you know, you, 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 it'll make you, it'll make it through it. So, um, I'm using a super stiff Scarpa right now. I have wide feet, so Scarpa fits my foot really well. Um, and you know, I just, half the battle is 
making sure they're broke in. You know, I mean, wearing the same exact when I'm training, when I'm hiking in the in the summertime, I wear the exact sock, boot, gator setup that I'm going to wear hunting because you know if you go changing something right before a hunt, you know you can lead to blisters or getting getting torn up in your feet or sore. Or, um, so that that's that's what I'm I'm using right now, and I'm I'm wearing. As much sheep hunting as I've been doing lately, I'm, I'm wearing two pairs of boots out a, a fall, basically. By the end of the fall, I've got one that's just dead and another one that's on its last legs. And are these synthetic boots? I'm, I'm using synthetic boots right now. Yeah, I'm, 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 uh, I'm using a Scarpa boot that's a really lightweight boot. Um, and then it, as it gets later in the fall, I'll be using our, our Grand Drew, the, the new one I've just got broke in. So I've always kind of got two boots in rotation because um, it seems like once you get them, when they start fitting really good, uh, they're dead. So, uh, I've always got another pair being broke in while I'm, while I'm wearing one. So in the times when you've gotten blisters on hunts on your feet, uh, what have you found is the best way to handle the blisters? Um, I find I get blisters if I don't let my feet dry out. Like I'll, if I, if I cross a stream or, you know, I try and not get wet, but if I get wet and then really grind out a whole day on wet feet, that's when I get blisters and, and everybody varies and it, by, by shoe, you know, depending on how your, your foot reacts to your boot. But, um, for me, blister care, I, I, I've got a pretty good system dialed. I use uh two inch by four inch. I think they're called Telfa. They're like a big, um, they're a big, uh, uh, like a giant band aid, but they have a really, really sticky fabric um, tape on them. And I use, I use those if I get a blister. Um, I don't like um, mole skin. It does. It's never sticks on my feet for whatever reason. I have like slippery feet or whatever. And I and then I use uh, really sticky um, single sided fabric tape. I found that anything that has fabric tape that works better for me. And then I. I have this uh, new stuff that I've been using if I do get a blizzard, bliss, blister called Tegaderm film. It's like this rubbery, they use it for burn victims, and it's like uh, this rubbery, sticky stuff that you put on, and then I put that over uh, underneath a, ba- uh, a bandage, and it works really good. But I, I uh, yeah, well, hopefully you don't get ban- uh, blisters. That's 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 definitely the key. And if you do start to feel a blister getting on, you know, coming on, you just got to pull your boots off and and, and and mess around with it and makes, you know, get it, get it to where it's feeling good. I, I find I don't get blisters if I listen to my feet right away, but if I don't just kind of grind it out and put an extra four or five miles on it and I can feel something rubbing, that's when it, uh, that's when I'll get a blister. And as far as blisters, do you pop, pop them or do you leave them be? Oh, it depends. I, I, I try not to pop them. I mean, they say don't pop them. I, I try not to, I try to run them through, but it, it depends on where they're at. It depends on how bad they are. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, the, the, the best blister care is to not get them. So uh, I, I've done both. I can't say that. I, I've heard guys say don't pop them. I, I don't know if it works better than, than popping them. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I've done it both ways. And it seems like if you get a blister, it's, it's going to bug you for a couple of days and, and it sucks. <laughs> yeah. Do you use trekking poles or no? I do. I use trekking poles. Um, if I'm on ice, I use an ice axe, either a Petzl or a uh, Stubai uh, telescoping ice axe. And then if it's not uh, a hunt where you're going to experience some kind of glacier or mid, you know, sh- sh- kind of that stuff, then I use uh, I use trekking poles, two of them. And uh, I have since 2008. And I, I rarely go on a hunt. I-, I can tell you when I'm when I'm out hunting and I forgot my trekking poles or I didn't bring them, I, I can tell the difference. I, I think it's um uh, they're just they're, they're almost they're, they're as essential as anything I use I almost won't go with anywhere without them what would you say about uh, tent ventilation and condensation inside the tent what do you do to combat that well you know it, I found that if it's windy you don't have a problem and, and no matter what tent you're using whether it's a four season three season single wall if it's, you know, static, nothing's blowing and it's, you know, fairly humid and you're in rain, you're going to get condensation. Um, a, a, a double wall tent, you know, a, a standard tent with a fly will have less condensation because it kind of puts you away from it. But I've been carrying a uh, just a small um, um, pack towel. It weighs like three ounces. And if you get heavy condensation, you just kind of wipe it up and rinse it outside or whatever. I mean, it, it's something you're going to deal with. Um, especially multiple days in a small environment. I, I don't know what the ultimate answer is. I mean, obviously you try and, you know, when it's not raining, you open your tent up and try and get it aired out. But, uh, 
Um, like I said, in the wind, it's not a problem. If you even a small breeze or nice days, it's never a problem. It's uh, it's generally, you know, when 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 nothing's moving, you're going to get a little condensation. And I, you know, like I said, if if you I keep everything in, you know, my sleeping bag when I leave every day, I put it in a waterproof bag. Uh, all my gear I have in waterproof bags. All the t- are you using the Kuyu waterproof bags? Yeah, yeah, I use XL medium. I mean, it just depends on what I'm using, but I, I, everything is in a, in its own waterproof bag. And uh, yeah, I found I just you know nothing ever really gets wet, and uh, you know prevention of getting wet. I, I I haven't had a wet sleeping bag or had to you know sleep something dry in a long time, and um, it's, I think it's just from taking the extra precaution to make sure everything is protected when you can protect it. If it got extra cold at night, uh, when you're sleeping, what are you sleeping in? Just your underwear? Or are you sleeping with your base layers? Uh, how do you how do you prepare when it's uh, colder sleeping? Well, to, to get back into kind of what my system is, I, I always take uh, a super down jacket and a super down pant, our full zip super down pant with me. It's always in the bottom of my pack. I, I don't think I've been anywhere without having those in my pack in the last five years. Um, in 2012, I got killed a mountain goat with my bow in the Chugach and it was just a gnarly night. I mean, we got stuck out above timberline and just pounding rain. And I had down pants with me, you know, down pants with me at the time. And, and, and it, and it made a night that, you know, we got, we basically got caught out. There was no way we could ex- ascend from where um, we, we could descend from where we were at uh, and get out of there. We had two goats down. It was just, you just had to tough it out right out the night. And it was, you know, a miserable 10 hours. And, I had my down stuff with me and I got it under my, my rain gear. And it was a, it wasn't a miserable night. It was, it was, it sucked. I mean, it wasn't super comfortable, but it wasn't, you know, one of those nights where you look back and go, Oh man, that was the worst thing in history. And it was because of the fact that I basically was wearing a sleeping bag and it was uh, so I, I've always just plan on if you're going to get caught out to, I have those two pieces with me um, at all the time. And if you have rain gear and, and a full down system underneath, you can, you can stay, relatively comfortable comfortable no matter what conditions you're in and uh i'm sorry what was the other part of the question um <laughs> i forgot it was such a good answer i forgot but um i want to ask you about the headlamp uh i know being able to see at night is important what do you carry a specific headlamp i'm carrying i've got a pile of them i i kind of have pack specific headlamps i i, I there's a couple things like uh, Havilon knives and pa- and, uh, and and headlamps that I just leave in each pack. I have a bunch of different packs, and all of them have the same thing in it. So I'm using uh, Petzl right now, which I really like. Um, I try and whatever headlamp I'm using, if I'm uh, if I got a GPS or I've got, I've got you know something that takes AA batteries, I try and make sure my headlamp takes the same batteries. So there, you know, if something goes down on me, I can I can use it. But um, yeah, I'm using I use a bunch of different ones. I mean, it is important. Um, and, and more often than not, if I use a headlamp for a while, I, I just try and replace the batteries on everything all the time. Even if you're throwing away pretty good batteries, I just, it's not worth it to, uh, to rotate through batteries. So I'm, uh, I just, you know, I keep them all one in every single pack and, um, you know, that's kind of what I do. One thing that really intrigues me is the food aspect of these backpack hunts mm-hmm. and, I've done some backpack hunts, and I know Dar and I are always trying to figure out the best way to bring food. And um, I want to hear about your food prep. Yeah, I'm pretty. I'm I'm a big stickler on the food thing. I I feel like <clears throat> it's one of the most overlooked things in hunting. I mean, it's amazing how many guys will have never eaten a mountain house in their life. They'll train for a once in a lifetime hunt, and uh, and show up in Canada or Alaska, or, and and all of a sudden they they've never react their bodies never reacted to uh eating a freeze-dried thing in their life they've never even eaten one um so i I, i'm a big proponent of you know trying them you know if if you're going to do a backpack and you're talking about freeze-dried and 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 really counting the calories so i i I really firmly believe in you need to you know i I take all my own food on every hunt i i I bring 10 days worth of food on every hunt lunches breakfast everything 100 percent. i don't rely on and, and most outfitters have great food there. They've, they've got the right stuff, but you just never know if you're going to have something. I've had a couple of mountain houses that just did not sit well with me. And um, so I, I've got a couple of mountain houses that, <clears throat> or, or I, I'm doing Hawk Vittles is another one, Backpacker's Pantry. I, I basically got three types of food that I really like and work well with me that I, that I take with me. And 
Uh, for example, like Mountain House, I, I take the, the two chicken breast and the mashed potatoes with rib meat. That's my favorite one. I'm actually taking 10 of those on this hunt because it reacts well with my body. I don't mind the taste whatsoever. It's fairly neutral. It's not something that I, you know, I've, I've operated on it a bunch and uh, it, it works good for me. <clears throat> as far as breakfast go, I take two um, uh, two oatmeals every day. I don't like eating breakfast. I don't normally eat breakfast. I force myself to eat two oatmeals a day and a coffee. And I, I'm a big coffee drinker, so I got to have coffee every day. And then at lunchtime, I take two. And, and you can see there's a video on this that Jason on Kuyu.com, our, our YouTube channel, he goes through what he takes. And, and, and we basically have very similar how we do it. But I take two bagels. Uh, Every day at lunch, um, two, two, two to four pieces of cheese, uh, two pieces of bacon per bagel, two pieces of salami per bagel. Um, I take three or four candy bars a day, the equivalent of I try and get a thousand calories in bars. And I I've went through rotated on and off on what I like. And I've found that I just like candy bars better than anything else. I mean, I, I can't eat power bars for 10 days straight. So I just. I've kind of gotten back to where I'm, I'm going as lightweight as I can with a lot of normal stuff that I that I eat all the time. So I, I generally count on two. You can get it down. I've got it down lower than this. But if you take two pounds a day, that's that's pretty much enough for anyone. I do slightly less than that. Um, I was a college wrestler. I can I've gone a long time without eating before. So I, I eat less calories than most guys would feel comfortable eating. But um, generally, if you count on two, two, two pounds a day total um you, you'll be pretty good and you know that's on, on a lot of these hunts you get resupplied halfway through so that's you know you're carrying 10 pounds of food on a backpack hunt and then maybe getting a drop or picked up somewhere in the middle and um you know i've, I've i just found that works the best for me so i always tell guys you know try the stuff you're going to take beforehand you know if you if you if you haven't eaten a lot of mountain house you know eat one you know two days a week to see which ones you like the best, you know, have your, you know, boil them up at night and instead of having a regular dinner, try them out in house and, and, and see if, see if it reacts well. I mean, it's going on some of these hunts, it'd be like, you know, you run on unleaded and all of a sudden you get to Canada and, and all I got is diesel. Well, you're just not going to operate that well, especially on a long hunt. Have you found mountain houses that you specifically don't like or that you think uh, would react badly with most people's bodies or had any experience with that? I, I, I mean, for me, the ones that are kind of over, I don't like any of the rice ones. I, um, you know, like I just like neutral, the neutral. Like spaghetti or lasagna or any of that, you don't like that. I hate the lasagna. I hate the spaghetti. Anything with the red sauce, I don't like. The turkey tetrazzini, I do not like. Um, the, you know, chicken and noodles, I like that one. And like I said, I'm taking 10 um, mashed potatoes, chicken breasts, and rib meat on this trip. I, I bought, I've got a whole case of them and that's just what I'm taking. I, I take some Tabasco with me and, uh, you know, you, do you take salt or pepper or any of that? Well, with those, you're definitely not going to need any extra salt, but no, I, I just basically my, my one food item that is kind of an extra thing that I take for, you know, just because I like the taste is I take a thing of Tabasco or Chipotle Tabasco or something along with me and, and that kind of spices it up. But you know, at the end of the day, it's just fuel, and uh, you know, I, I almost I eat less than most people, and and everybody that hunts with me is always like, man, you you do not eat that much, and I, I it just comes from cutting weight growing up and wrestling, and I just eat less than most people. But for me, it's just I force myself to eat everything I've got with me every day because because you need it. But I, I'm not one of those guys that gets super hungry. But I've hunted with guys that just can't get enough to eat. So you got to just kind of you know figure out how much you're you're going to be using a day and you know at the end of the day you're not going to eat everything you want to on a backpack hunt you're not you, you're going to be you're going to crave some stuff you know you're just gonna to have to grind through it i mean it's you you can't possibly pack enough that you're eating what you ate you know at home and and you know if you're if you're really walking all day and glassing all day and hiking all day you, you can't carry enough calories with you so you're going to be on a deficit and you just got to realize that um you're going to hit the wall and and you're going to be hungry and and it's going to suck for a minute and you'll get over it. Um, you're not going to die. That's part of your mental toughness yeah. that you were talking about. Just prepare your mind for it and know that you're going to miss some things. And um, I, I think that's part of what you were saying with mental preparation. Do you, as far as, uh, do you carry a spork or what do you carry? I carry a, a for, REI mix, actually a long spoon and uh, I've probably got 10 of them. I, I carry a long spoon. I, I carry a, uh, it depends on the hunt. If I'm, if I'm bringing my own, 
if it's if it's my hunt, I bring my own stove. I'm, I'm, I bring an MSR reactor. Um, if we're going up north and I'm flying, I bring a MSR that's got a that takes fuel. Obviously, you can't fly with the canisters, or I'll ship them up there ahead of time. But I take a uh, a, a little insulated cup, a long spoon, and then I have uh, generally a Gatorade bottle or a Nalgene or um, you know just just um, th- those are the three things I take, you know, you, you, everything else you, you can eat with your hands. Uh, the, uh, the, the little insulated cup is for, um, coffee and for, uh, oatmeal in the mornings and, and any kind of hot drink you want. Um, I do take drink mixes with me. I've been taking the wilderness athlete stuff for a while. It, you know, really, really like it. It works good for me. Um, so yeah, I just, I try and take a minimum. There's other stuff you can take that makes it more convenient, but you know, every time you throw one of those convenient things in, your pack weight goes up. Yeah, I want to jump back to, you said you do candy bars. Are you talking like the full length, you know, six, eight inch bars? Or are you talking about the little two inch bite size bars? No, I do full candy bars. I, I think, you know. Like Snickers and Milky Way, what do you what do you like? Yeah, I like, uh, Snickers is a good one. Um, Twix is a good one. I mean, basically, if you can get 100 calories per ounce, that's kind of what I look at. I just, I mean. You can get a little, a few or more calories per ounce on some stuff, but you know, again, whatchamacallit is one of my favorites. So I just, I just take stuff that I like to eat and yeah, you might have an ounce or two more here and there, but, um, at the end of the day, I, I, I went on the whole power bar for a whole trip and, uh, you know, I take generally take one goo a day, one, one, um, you know, liquid goo shot, um, um, you know, maybe a power bar. I just kind of try and mix it up because I, I, I've went, I, I've, I've done a, a hunt where I just went absolute lightest weight, most calories I could get. And it got pretty old after a while. And it was like, I didn't really save that much weight. I didn't. Um, and, and I, and I got to where I almost couldn't even stomach a power bar towards the end of it. So just depends. I mean, I, I just, I kind of have a system dialed now that functions well with my body and, um, you know, like a little sugar, you know, like, it just it just depends on again it's it's more putting yourself through what you know it, it, you wouldn't break in a set of boots on a hunt the first day and you shouldn't do that with food I mean you just need to you know take some stuff that uh, that 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 works well with your body. Brendan, are there times when there's uh, blackberries or huckleberries or any of that kind of stuff um, that naturally do you, do you pick up along the way and do you eat, or is that is that not common in that type of country? Yeah, in the Yukon there was there was tons, and some places in Alaska and goat hunts. Yeah, if you can hammer out some blueberries, you you almost can't eat enough of those. But um, you know, and, and you know, in, in the Yukon we had a place where you know they had left a fishing rod and caught a couple fish. I mean, you, you kind of eat whatever you can. Um, and obviously once you kill a sheep, you just devour that thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, you just, you, you kind of become a, a forager until you kill your sheep and you just, you know, you try and get as much as you can. And, um, yeah, I mean, there's nothing, nothing better than a blueberry in Alaska. That's for sure. That's all great stuff. Uh, Brendan, what is your pack, uh, that you've got all ready to go on this, the next two trips? What are, what is it coming in at weight wise? So it's, I'm think with I have a I have an ultra lightweight rifle. It, there's a couple of things that are the curve killers on your pack. I mean, I can get sub 40 pounds. Right? Let's say without the rifle. Without the rifle and without the spotty scope. Like on on these trips, I'm taking a 95 swirl and a big tripod, which it, you know that's 10 pounds extra that I'm carrying because you know I want to look at these rams. I want to count rings. I, I just I love looking at sheep and I hate sharing a spotting scope and. If I was going on a, 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 your first sheep hunt or you're going with a guy and, you, and, and you're not really into that stuff, leave that, you know, bring your glass if it's good glass and, and, and use it with the guide. But, um, you know, that's not something that everybody needs to take on a sheep. Hunt. I just prefer, I mean, being a guide, and I, I love looking at sheep. I love finding my own sheep. I love glassing. So I take that stuff. So there's an extra 10 pounds. And then, you know, another six, my, my rifle is 6.2 pounds with four shells in it. Um, so, but I, I'm, I'm sub 40 pounds with food on a 10 day hunt right now, or, or right at 40 pounds, basically. How much extra ammo do you take? Um, depends on the hunt. Um, if it's a multi-species, like in the Yukon, I took, I brought 15 rounds with me, I think. I Four in the gun and nine. And, and same with bow hunting uh, on an archery hunt. I take a dozen arrows, three practice arrows, three backup arrows, and six regular, just because you just never know what's going to happen. I mean, um, but 
not a ton. I mean, you shouldn't, you shouldn't plan on, I mean, 10 to 15 at the most. I mean, and especially, you know, it seems like a lot, but you know, you get a ram that gets wounded or, or, you know, I mean, you get in country that where you have unlimited wolf tags or, um, you know, you got a mountain caribou tag. I mean, yeah, you, you might have to protect your, you know, I mean, Wolverine stuff like that. I mean, I want to be prepared if something, uh, you know, a good opportunity arises. Water filtration. I've been a pill guy forever. I, um, the, the catadine filters are really nice. There's a lot of nice water filters that, the drain bags, I'm trying to think of what the name of it is I've used, but um, I've used iodine pills forever. I don't think I have the highest degree of taste buds, so um, I've just found that purification of water or getting it out of springs, I, I, I uh, yeah, I, I, it depends on the hunt. If if there, it's prone to catch giardia or, you know, it's not, you know, if, if, if you're in glacier country, you don't have to worry about it. I've never, I've never had a problem with stuff coming straight off of ice. Do you just drink right out then? Just if it's flat, just if, lay down and drink. Yeah, if it's coming right out of ice, I've never had a problem. I, I'll that's that's a that's a risk I'm willing to take. Anywhere else, like stagnant water, all that stuff, you definitely need a purifier. Put pills in it. Um, I caught Giardia on my first. Um, I was shooting gophers with my bow on my first uh, doll sheep hunt, and I think I got some nasty stuff off my hands, and I I I got sick on my first doll sheep hunt. It was not pleasant. So anything you can do to avoid that. Um, you know, a lot of guys, I mean, a lot of guys carry flagell with them if they do get sick, you know, stuff to kill, um, back, you know, the bacteria, but, um, yeah, generally if you just super fast running streams coming straight out of ice, you're fine. Otherwise iodine pills and let them sit, you know, just, it, it's definitely important. Toilet paper or wet wipes? Ha, huh, it's funny. Uh, pre dehydrated wet wipes and you just wet them when you get up there, but yeah. Wet wipes. Okay, so you keep them in a plastic bag. They're dry, uh, and then you just wet them as you need them. Yeah, and I, I take, uh, I bring a whole packet, and, and and they're really nice just for, uh, you know, seven day funk. You know, you get to a stream, and you know they're a little more durable than any kind of paper, and you can just you know kind of wash your whole self down, and um, yeah, those the little the little conveniences for sure. Speaking of the seven day funk, I mean, is it common to get to a a creek and just totally strip down and basically just clean yourself or do you just do a little bit here and there? I mean, yep. I, yeah. I, I know some guys that just get in totally and just clean them whole, the, their whole selves off. Yeah. I, I mean, on my Yukon, huh, we were uh, seven days into it had done 50 plus miles. I mean, I just dived right in the lake. It depends. I mean, in glacier country, you better be a tough dude to be hopping in and getting clean. <laughs> and I can, I can barely shrinkage. Shrinkage is a problem. <laughs> yeah, and I don't. I don't know if I'm unusually sensitive, but man, water's <laughs> a different deal. But yeah, I mean, like I said, the the whole scent free thing on a mountain hunt is um, it, it, it's just not going to happen. I mean, if you're burning the kind of calories and sweating the amount of sweat that you use and carrying a full backpack, I mean, you better have the wind in your favor because it, it it's not going to work out well if you don't. I mean, it's, it's the bottom line is there's nothing you can do about it. Um, you try and you know merino wool helps and you know, maybe a wash here and there, but at, at the end of the day, when you're burning that many calories and you're that many, you know, campfires and smoke and all, you know, there's no such thing as scent free when in mountain hunting, just not. Brendan, shifting gears a little bit, how achievable is it for the average guy to go on a sheep hunt? It's uh, it's more than people think. You know, it's it's funny. I I uh, I've been on quite a few sheep hunts, and and you know, I'm just your regular guy. I got a regular job like anybody else. Obviously, I'm in the hunting industry, but you know, at the end of the day, I, I think people put it up on a pedestal and think, oh, man, that's so expensive and it's so out of out of, out of the realm. And I, I read a really cool article probably 10, 15, 10 years ago that Glenn Landris, who's a, a really good guide in, in, in Oregon, Washington, had written. And, you know, a lot of people buy ski boats. A lot of people buy super fancy cars and, and you know, digital, you know, extra TVs and all that stuff. And if you start, you know, set a goal and in three years, I'm going to say $15,000 and go on a doll sheep hunt. It's not that hard to do if it's a priority. And, you know, if, 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 if a kidney transplant was, was three years out and you had to save $15,000, it would be nothing to do it. But because it's, you know, kind of an expendable item and um, people don't, don't look at it that way. And um, for me, you know, I've got a family, I've got kids and, you know, mortgage and everything else, but if you prioritize, you know, I don't have a ski boat. Uh, I don't have a lot of other hobbies. Um, if you prioritize, it's it's easily doable. You know, doll sheep is 
the most achievable. I would say stone sheep probably aren't, um, you know, but it, it it is achievable for sure. What is the best uh, first sheep hunt for someone getting started? What would you recommend? A doll sheep hunt. I, I would I would say a doll sheep hunt, and and I'd really do a lot of research. Um, the success rate in the Northwest Territories in the Yukon is a lot higher than in Alaska. There's some great hunts in Alaska. Um, if you're going to do a hunt in Alaska, which is slightly cheaper, um, just do your research. You know, go with a good guy in a good area that has high success rate. Um, but yeah, doll sheep hunt is is definitely doable. I mean, um, when you look at the average price of, you know, some elk hunts and anything else, you know, I mean, right now the, the, the going price in Alaska is about 15,000. Um, the going price in the Northwest territories in the Yukon is between 17 and 21. Um, you know, and, and, uh, that's, that, that's uh, the, the doll sheep is definitely the, the most achievable one. And, and it's probably, the the most pure it, it's probably the best sheep hunt in North America really I mean that and stone sheep I mean uh, there it's it's a fantastic hunt I mean it's it's something if you only do one um, you, no one ever died looking back and go man I wish I wouldn't have went on that doll sheep hunt I can tell you that Brendan let's talk about doll sheep uh, and talk about field judging and some of the tips that you use. Uh, either A, to judge the rams as far as age, and B, to judge the rams as far as size. Um, walk through what you're looking for and some of the tips that you've learned over the years. Well, I, I'm definitely not a thin horn expert. Um, I, I've, I've kind of got a look that I look for. And, and the most important thing when you're talking about uh, doll sheep is is age. Um, you know, there's great big – I mean, doll sheep are – they really come down to areas like some areas have better genetics than others. Um, but at the end of the day, if you kill a, a, a 10 plus year old ram, that's, that's a tremendous sheep, no matter where you're at, whether he's got 12 inch bases or whether he's got 15 inch bases. Um, um, and, and, you know, the area you're hunting will depend on the size of sheep. And like I said, I'm no thin horn expert. What I look for is a really pretty ram that I want to look at on the wall. And I look for age, you know, I want to kill a, uh, you know, an old ram. I mean, if you, you that, that's, that's really the most important thing. I mean, the big, when you say old, what do you mean, Brennan? What's that? When you say old, what do you mean? Well, a legal ram in 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 Alaska is is eight years old, heavily broomed, or full curl. So anything that's a legal sheep in Alaska is a pretty nice sheep. Once you get towards ten years old, that's 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 a really good ram. I mean, they they live to fourteen occasionally, but between ten and fourteen, they're all gone. So a, a ten plus year old ram is is an awesome ram, no matter no matter where you're at. Um, in the Yukon, uh, the, the, the legal age is full curl, uh, eight years old or full curl. Um, in Northwest Territory, it's actually smaller. It's three quarter curl. Um, but there's not an outfitter in the, in the, in the Northwest Territories that allow you to shoot a sheep that isn't, I mean, I think the average is pushing is close to 11 if you had to check in the Northwest Territories because they're sheep densities. But, um, yeah, any legal sheep that's over eight is, is a great ram. And the older they get, the bigger they are. I mean, the majority of the biggest doll sheep that you see when when you see guys killing those great big monsters, I don't think anybody looks at those very long. I mean, they're just so big and they're so impressive that um, they have a natural beauty to them, especially the really big ones. Um, that yeah, I mean, what I'm looking for, I mean, I haven't had enough thin horns to where I can be picky enough to where oh, I'm looking for a 40 inch ram or this or that. Like, I just want to kill an old ram, have a great hunt. Um, and I kind of rely on who I'm hunting with to tell me, you know, exactly how big it is. I mean, if, if we, it was big horns, it's a different thing, but, um, uh, when it's, when it comes to dolls and stones, it's, I'm just, you know, I, I'm not at the point where I'm, I'm going to be passing up 10 year olds yet. So a person starting out on a doll sheep hunt, they get up there, they go through all of the prep, they, you know, they're ready to go. They get up there, um, first day out and boom, there's a legal ram. In your opinion, shoot or don't shoot, um, how do you prepare mentally for, you know, having to pass on something that maybe you won't get a chance at in the next 10 days? If that's a simple one. If you can't leave without one, shoot. I mean, if you've killed other sheep and you're looking for something better and, you, and, you, and you're comfortable putting everything you got into it, and at the end of the day, if you come home and you didn't get one and you're fine with that, then then pass it up. But if, if at the end of the day, you came up there to get a doll sheep, and there's a, a legal ram, which is an eight-year-old full curl or heavily broomed ram, um, and 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 you can't go home without one. You've saved a lot of money. Absolutely, shoot that ram. I mean, there's just there's um, you 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 know any legal there there. It's just again, it's a personal choice. But I know on my first doll sheep hunt, 
there might have been bigger rams around when I was hunting, but I could not pass up. Believe I didn't know if I'd get back. You know, I've been fortunate enough to go back and and hunt a lot of sheep, but I didn't know at that time if I would. And, and I, you know, I, I couldn't have been more happy with the sheep I killed. Brendan, you see a lot of cancellation hunts, discounted hunts, kind of late in the season. What does that actually mean? Well, can't, I, I get this a lot. Uh, a lot of guys call me. It's like, oh, you know, they'll call six months in advance. Hey, I, I got an option on a cancellation hunt. That's not a cancellation hunt. That's a hunt they couldn't sell um, or a guy backed out or something like that. I, I, the term cancellation hunt gets thrown around. I mean, I, I've had a few a cancellation hunt is within two weeks, like somebody actually backed out. And there's some great deals to be had if you're in the right place at the right time. But you, you're not going to get – if you're going to get a great deal on a sheep hunt and it's a good sheep hunt and not a scam, and there is a lot of scams out there, um, it's something that you're just going to have to be ready to, to leave on in a, on short notice. And it's generally with a good outfitter and, you know, so, somebody, you know, basically doesn't have time – uh, you know, it's walking away from some money. Uh, but a, a cancellation is not six months ahead of time. Um, you know, it's, it's a true, it's a time crunch more than it is a money thing. Um, so, you know, for me, I, I just tell guys, just do your research and, you know, have the money sitting there. And, and if you're truly going to take advantage of a cancellation, hunt, you have to be able to leave at a minute's notice. I mean, that's one of the reasons. And be prepared. Yeah. I mean, physically and everything, you have to be ready to roll. One of the reasons I've been on so many sheep hunts that I have is because I'm always ready. I mean, my, I'm always in. If somebody calls me and said, uh, hey, I got a stone sheep hunt and this guy walked away from a $20,000 deposit and we're selling it for this, you know, like you got to be ready and anticipate that that's going to happen because, um, you know, if that does happen and they are rare, um, it won't come around twice. I've had a couple of them come up while, um, and I call a few guys like, Hey, here's a great deal. It's cancellation hunt. This guy can't be there. You got to be there in four days. And it's always like, ah, oh, well, I, you know, I, ah, I, I wish I could, I oh, call me next time. It's like the mentality has to be, if that kind of a deal comes up, you got to drop everything and leave. And, uh, and, and you got to be there within three, four days. And, and that's a true cancellation hunt. And that's the only way you're going to get an absolute screaming deal. If, if you can plan for it, it's not really a cancellation hunt. Brendan, what is your long-term strategy for hunting sheep as far as drawing, you know, booking hunts, raffles, whatever? Um, I'm in every drawing in the West for every sheep you can be in. And, you know, I've, I've, I've been unusually lucky. I'm in every, you know, I go to all, you know, obviously being in the industry, I go to all the shows. I mean, I won a stone sheep hunt in 2012. 2,500 people in a room and, and pulled my ticket. Um, I'm in every drawing for everything that I want to hunt, every um, every state drawing, every lottery. I buy a ticket for everything. And, um, you know, my my long-term strategy is just to get lucky um, and, and hopefully draw a few tags in my life. And then on, on the booking end, I, I, I set up for my first sheep hunt in 2008. I was going to hunt sheep every five years, uh, you know, and I think that was that's a reasonable goal to be able to save enough money and and go on a, on a, on a big hunt like that every five years. And that's, that's, I've, I've far exceeded that, um, since I set that goal. But at the end of the day, you know, if you're, if you're doing that, um, that, that's, that's been my goal. And I, like I said, I've, I've had way more opportunities than I thought I ever would, but, um, you know, it's, it's just important to set a goal and decide, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, it takes a lot of discipline to just finally decide that, you know, that's what you're going to do and you set your mind to it. And um, it's been great having you on today. Uh, you know, I uh, always enjoy checking out all your photos and um, talking to you and Jason about your hunts. And one of the things that I admire most about you guys at Kuyu is the fact that and not picking on other companies, but I just don't see the level of commitment to the mountain hunting like I see with you and Jason. And I think it trickles down through the whole company. Um, and I think one of the main reasons for the success of Kuyu is, you know, from the top down, from you guys down, um, you guys truly live it and it's obvious that you love what you do. You're, this isn't a job. It's, it's a way of life. And, um, that's, that's always been something I've admired at, at Kuyu and, um, I'm anxious to see how you do up there. I know you'll do well. Um, can't wait to see how, how it goes for you.
Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's, it is one of those things where we, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you got to go on these hunts because you, you, you can't forget why you do what you do. Um, and, and that's always been a, a part of the company and it's, and it, and it makes it fun. And, 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 you know, the other part, we have a good time doing it and that's, it's, it's just really a cool thing. And one other thing, uh, Jay, if, if anybody wants a copy of my gear list, um, they can just write in or call Kuyu.com or write into to Kuyu at service at Kuyu.com and ask for Brendan's personal sheep hunting gear list or it's our Kuyu main gear list that we do. And, and uh, if anybody wants a sample of a gear, a really great gear list, I'm more than happy to get that to anybody. And it, it's more in depth, obviously and we talk about, I can't, you know, it goes down to the, all the minutia and all the, all kinds of stuff. But if you want that, you can, you can uh, write in the service and, and they'll send that to you. That's awesome. Well, thanks for being on. And uh, the next time I talk to you, uh, you'll have two more sheep under your belt and I can't wait to see the photos. Oh, before we go, uh, what camera do you take um, to, to capture the memories of the hunt? Oh, good question. Yeah, um, I've been using a Sony NEX, which is a micro SLR um, camera. I love, I mean, I've, I've found, I'm not a great photographer, but I take a lot of pictures. And, you know, if I take, uh, I take three extra batteries and uh, I take this little micro SLR with, with one lens and it's kind of got a long lens and it takes panorama and takes video and everything else. And, you know, I average, you know, 700 to a thousand photos I take on a trip and I find I've, I've got some great photos when it's all done. So yeah, that, that micro SLR, I mean, I've had big SLR cameras and I just don't get it out enough. This, these, the micro SLR, like the Sony NEX, I find that it's on my hip all the time. And I, I, even though it's probably not the quality of some of the bigger cameras, I find I'm using it more and, and I end up with better images. And is that like a 16 uh, card or a 32 or what size card do you take? I think I'm using like a 64. I, I, as big as a, a huge card, I've never even got close to, I've got pictures from years and years on it. But uh, yeah, I, I take a huge card and, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a mirrorless micro SLR. The NEX is the Sony that I'm using. So it's, it's a great camera. I don't know, I mean, the technical jargon about it, but it's, it's really been great for me. Awesome. That's great. And that rounds out our interview here. Uh, Brendan, thanks for being on. Thanks for being a friend of the podcast. I wish you the best up there and uh, have two great hunts. Be safe and we'll be chatting at you down the road here. All right, Jay. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to the Jay Scott Outdoors Western Big Game Hunting and Fishing Podcast brought to you by GoHunt.com Insider. Use the promo code JSCOTT and receive a $50 Kuyu gift card when signing up for the GoHunt.com Insider. Research faster, hunt more, go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider and join today.